What up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 47, the Father's Day edition. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Shout out to my dad. Dude's an OG. Taught me so much about life and business and people and relationships and street smarts, just everything I needed to know to grow up to be the person I am today. So super excited to be here. I go live almost every Sunday. And the purpose of these lives is to provide insight and value to you as e-commerce business owners or aspiring e-commerce business owners. So I'm here to be a value and a maximum service. Any questions you have, ask away. I'll be here 20, 30 minutes today and we'll get right into it. Welcome everybody. What do you got going on today? If you're a dad, put a fire emoji in the chat. Shout out to all you dads out there showing up and being accountable, right? Because it's one thing to be a dad. Anybody can pop out a kid, but it's another thing to be an active dad. It's a big difference there. So as far as Amazon sales, there's just a question. Sales are a little slow. It's very typical this time of year. June, July, August, typically slowest time of the year, but also depends on what type of products you're selling. But for everyday wholesale, consumable products, grocery, health and beauty, home and kitchen, this will typically be the slowest time of the year, especially July and the beginning of August. Now, the reason why it's the slowest time of the year is because kids are out of school, people are traveling, so they're just not shopping on Amazon as much. But it's cool because right now you need to be planning for your Q4. You should be already requesting deals and special catalogs from your wholesalers, distributors, vendors for Q4 discounts, right? We're placing orders for Halloween candy, Thanksgiving products, holiday products. We already, we already placed a lot of those orders and the orders that we haven't placed in the next couple of weeks, we will be placing them. Yeah, so eSellers or I comes with three main resources. Resource number one is the step-by-step -step guided course content. This is the framework, right? This is where we train you the same exact way I train my team. Nobody gets employed at my company until they go through eSellers RI, right? It's like the deciding factor of if they're going to cut it or not. Um, the second resource is live weekly coaching for the first four months inside your inside the community. These are private calls that happen on Monday nights, and they're super resourceful, right? There's about 30 to 50 people on the call. I stay for about two hours and then we leave the call open for anybody who wants to hang out afterwards and network. And then the third resource is private community access, which serves as essentially a 24 seven chat support. So Mr. Boog, we'd love to have you inside. The sellers inside are crushing it. And I want to ship you one of these. This is just one of our trophies. This is the $500,000 a month trophy. So I'd love to get you one of these or even the 100K, the 50K, uh, because it's possible inside these sellers where I. Uh, Daniel said, I have a product that has a seller that has 95% of the sales. Should I keep selling it? It is FBM. Well, the first question I'd ask you, Daniel, is what percentage of the sales are you getting and how many units does that equate to? Because right? if the one seller is getting 95% and you're getting the full other 5%, but the listing is moving a thousand units a month. That's 50 units a month. I'm comfortable continuing to sell a product where I can move 50 units a month as long as it meets my minimum profit requirements. So yeah, you know, it's really going to depend on how much inventory you're selling with that seller dominating 95% of the buy box. And if it's moving for you and the profits make sense, then absolutely keep selling it. Besides Amazon Lit, who are a few accounts you think provide some good insight? Uh, Scott Needham, smartest seller. Dudes in OG, as far as like OA, you could go flips for miles. Those are the two I'd recommend. Private label, Derek DeMayo, Jamie Davidson. Those are some people I suggest following. These are people who've been in the game for, for years and years and years. These are people I see at all the Amazon events. These are people who have large communities. They're thriving, right? And I personally like to surround myself with businesses and business owners that are thriving because there's always more to learn. The day I think I know it all is the day I stop growing. But yeah, so typically this time of year, it's just a little slower, but that's okay. We, we, we take the summer months to focus on our internal systems to make sure everything's working properly, right? So when I'm talking internal systems, I'm making sure we have frameworks, right? Proper communication between our teams, that our buyers are trained properly, that our repricing, super important, that we're repricing our products, right? 
accurately so we're able to dominate the buy box and get a larger percentage of the buy box share because if your products are repriced properly then it doesn't matter how much profitable inventory you send to amazon if it's not selling it's not making you money and if it's not making you money your business isn't growing so i spent the uh, past week up in canada visiting some of our inner circle members businesses Price history tracking into Google is you could uh, create a new column, a Boolean column called promo, and then you could have it to yes, no, true, false, right? What's so, Boolean? Inner Circle Warehouse visit day three. We're at a completely different company. Super excited. It's a brand new warehouse. They literally just got the keys a couple days ago. So, we're out here going to help them set it up, optimize. So, from the rip, they're pumping units out of this place. Super excited about it. Hit it, apply, and it's done. Okay. And then you'll see, we just come to your new PO here and refresh it. And now every single item is on this new purchase order. Okay. So now you just merge two purchase orders in a matter of seconds. Uh, we visit two different companies, two different warehouses, two completely different operations. And one of the beautiful things I love about Inner Circle is I get it's an inside view um, directly to some of these companies in their biggest pain points. So it allows me to serve all of you at the highest level possible because I understand the ins and outs of different businesses and how they operate in different countries, right? And and something that's a common theme in most businesses that I visit is a lack of understanding clear financial data from your company, right? Knowing exactly what your net profits are month over month, exactly what your average net profits are for every single ASIN that you sell. Breaking down your supplier health and analyzing the data to make sure you're analyzing customer returns, average profit per ASIN, net profit per ASIN, average sale price per ASIN, like understanding all this data and breaking it down and seeing it visually in an Excel document. And this is something we're going to be covering at the event Ecom Summit out in Chicago at the beginning of August. Like understanding this data is just imperative to business growth because something we learned maybe four or five years ago when we started breaking this information down, we were continuing to purchase from suppliers that really weren't even making us any money after after we analyzed like returns and stuff. We were dealing with a big beauty supplier. We bought a bunch of hair clippers and beard trimmers, high-end products. I'm talking Andis. Um, I can't think of some of the other names, but we'll just use Andis as one of the example, right? Hair trimmers that sell purchase price anywhere from $100 to $200, sale price on Amazon anywhere from $150 to $300. And we were moving tons of or inventory, selling hundreds of these a month, right? But when we took a step back and analyzed the data versus returns and lost money because of those returns, we really were operating at like a 1% or 2% net margin. And for the amount of money we were dumping into these Andis products to operate at a 1% or 2% net margin, it didn't make any sense. So we stopped doing it. And we allocated those funds that we were investing in those Andis products and health and beauty products. We allocated those funds to more profitable inventory, which changed the game for us. Yeah. So, no, we never did any online arbitrage. But in our in our early days, we were super heavy on retail arbitrage. That's how we built our business in year one, two and the first portion of year three. Uh, we were going super aggressive, Costco, Sam's Club, BJ's, and there's still a lot of opportunities at those clubs. Um, and we went super aggressive on RA. You know, we were picking up multiple uh, van fulls, and then it switched to multiple truckloads a week. And we were packaging the inventory in Sebastian's Uncle Basement, Humble Ted, and we were shipping it out. What's the difference working with the brand or a distribution center? Um, so a brand direct relationship usually comes with some sort of commitment from you, whether it's ad spend, listing optimization, projections. When you're working with a DC, a distribution center or a distributor, typically there's a few things to consider. One, their prices are usually more competitive than going brand direct. Now, the reason why their prices are more competitive, you would think, why wouldn't it be cheaper from going brand direct versus purchasing from a distributor? Well, here's the math and the science behind it, right? If I go brand direct, I might purchase, let's say, five pallets of a couple SKUs from that brand. 
right? But these distributors are purchasing five, 10 truckloads of those couple SKUs. So those brands have to give the distributors a much more competitive price. So they're able to distribute that inventory across the country. So typically you'll see more competitive pricing going direct with wholesalers and distributors than you will going manufacturer or brand direct. Also, one of the biggest difference and one of the reasons why I love going directly to wholesalers and distributors is just the access to a larger catalog. When you're dealing with brands, you will only have access to the brand that they create, the brand that they manufacture, which limits your opportunity. But when you partner with a wholesaler or distributor, you have access to thousands, if not tens of thousands of different brands. So it really opens up a whole line of opportunity. And I'm actually starting a new series because through my distribution company, I get a lot of emails every single day, between five and 10 emails every single day. I mean, Sebastian and Cannon the other day, we were looking at these emails and they are hilarious. The emails that are sent to us, they're so ridiculous. People are using templates. Typically, it's VAs who are sending us these emails and people are using templates and they're not removing like the parentheses or the quotation marks, their first names in caps, their businesses in caps, their spacing in the email is ridiculous. Their vocabulary is terrible. It's like and then people wonder why they're not opening any wholesale accounts. And it's like, have you reached out yourself or are you using somebody from overseas to build these relationships? Because the emails I'm getting from these these companies overseas and these virtual assistants that say we represent so-and-so company, the emails are trash, straight up trash. They're not going to sugarcoat it. The emails from the virtual assistants I receive in my wholesale company are literally a joke. And then people wonder why they can't open good wholesale accounts. It's like, And for example, someone messaged me the other day, hey, E, my VAs aren't open any good accounts. You got any suggestions? And the first question I asked them, I said, have you tried opening any of these accounts yourself? And what was the gentleman's answer? No, I haven't tried. So it's like, why? You're going to email me looking to solve your broken virtual assistant problem when you haven't even tried doing it yourself. So is it the case that you're your VAs are actually not finding profitable suppliers or have you not trained them properly? And typically it's the latter. You have not trained them properly. So your unwillingness to take accountability for the pitfalls in your business are preventing you from continuing to grow. It's plain and simple, right? I'm a zero excuse type of guy. Take zero fucking excuses. I don't want to hear them because there's literally a solution to every single problem if you're open to it, but it's going to take effort on your end. And that's what separates the people who crush it and the people who stay stagnant or see a decline in their business in any industry, not just Amazon. Yeah. 16 aces is good for a first PO. It kind of spreads out your, your investment, gives you some opportunity. And then what you do is you'd send those to Amazon and then you'd analyze the profitability and the sales movement. And you double down on the aces that worked and eliminate the ones that didn't and add some new SKUs to your next order. So I think 16 aces, Leon, is a great start to your first purchase order. Um, what should I do to avoid missed freight pickups? Amazon partner carrier. Um, so make sure you're available for the pickup. That's number one. Number two, you asked and long check-in times, 2D box content labels. You know, and a lot of people will tell you that, hey, 2D, it doesn't affect the, the time that it takes Amazon in to receive your inventory. Uh, but I completely disagree with that because I've worked directly with companies who don't use 2D box content labels. And I've worked with companies in my own company that does use 2D box content labels. And just from the data that I see, 2D box content labels greatly increase the received time of your inventory. So this gentleman made four to six and 46,000 in revenue. What do I think would be a nice profit out of the $46,000 in revenue? Um, I would say anywhere from five to $15,000 would be substantial. All right, five on the low end, 15 on the higher end. Yeah, I hear you, Peerless. Snow Globe, she's four years into arbitrage and she's tired. I hear you. That's the reason why I made the transition to wholesale, because we were tired too. It's an exhausting process. I just got off the phone call at 9.30 a.m. with a gentleman up in Canada who's doing RA. Guy's working six days a week at his full-time job, and he's got two kids. And after work, after you know a 10 to 12 hour shift, he's going to retail stores and buying inventory. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. 
So it's important to start at least incorporating some wholesale. And that's why a lot of people join these sellers right for the roadmap. You don't have to make the full transition overnight. It's probably going to take multiple months to make that transition, if not a full year to make that transition. But if you don't get started, the transition is never going to happen. So it's like important to take action immediately unless you want to continue to live that day to day life or run into retail stores, you know, and constant online arbitrage leads which is time consuming because you can purchase five of this, 10 of this, maybe 15 or 20 of that on the, on like a super special day, but it's even hard to get that amount of quantity out of retail and arbitrage and uh, online or retail arbitrage and online arbitrage business model. It's complicated. Um, how do you compete with sellers who use automated pricing or a repricer to beat your price? We have a repricer and automated pricing. To, compete, to combat their price drops and price movements within the Amazon listing. That's the solution. Get a repricer as well. Um, Amazon has an automated repricer, which you can play around with. It will teach you a lot about repricing. You can set up rules and stuff, but we suggest using third-party repricers. For brand new sellers, Be Cool is great. For sellers doing less than $25,000, Go Aura is great. For sellers doing over $25,000 a month, we suggest using SellerSnap. I mean, we have discounts for all of those inside of our community as well. Yeah, absolutely. Stack or starve. That's that's one of the biggest problems that Amazon sellers face is opening up distribution and wholesale accounts. So we give you the blueprint. I literally teach you every single method that I've used in my company to open up every single wholesale account I've ever opened. We give you templates, phone scripts, the whole nine. And then the purpose of the live weekly calls and the community support is to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. If you have any specific questions about a specific company that you're having trouble dealing with, opening an account with, requesting discounts with, communicating with, um, reporting discrepancies with, whatever the issue is, we're there to guide you. Yeah, I, I feel that 2D transparent or not 2D transparency, 2D box content labels also help with the accuracy of the inventory being received, right? Because I don't know if you've ever visited a, a fulfillment center or a transfer uh, center for Amazon, distribution center for Amazon, but what happens is your inventory gets received, right? And whether it's SPD, LTL, FTL, they start unloading it and scanning it. Now, if it doesn't have those 2D box content labels, what they're doing is opening all those boxes and scanning individual UPCs, right? Which is a tedious process. But if you got those 2D box content labels, they're just scanning the outside of the box and sending it to the truck that's going to Tennessee, sending it to the truck that's going to Nevada, sending it to the truck that's going to California. They're instantly spider webbing your inventory, which saves you on receive times. And the quicker you can get your inventory listed live on Amazon for sale, the quicker you're able to make a return on your investment for that purchase of inventory. So it's a no brainer implementing 2D box content labels. It's literally a no brainer. We're one of the first companies ever in Amazon to use 2D box content. We implemented them maybe, I want to say 2017, maybe 2018, and it's changed the game for us. And what a lot of people don't consider about 2D box content labels is the amount of time it saves you in your own um, packaging process. It's a game changer. What kind of estimate sales requirement do you suggest looking for in the Canadian marketplace? So because a uh, Canadian marketplace is got a little lower, well, a lot lower. It's about 10% of the total sales volume in the States. Um, we would buy typically anything that's moving at least 12 units for our company. So if we run the numbers, and this is based on your minimum buying requirements, right? Because if it's meeting your minimum buying requirements, then it checks off as a listing that we would purchase. Um, but in the U.S., we do anything really 24, but when we started, we would do as low as 12. And if it was a high ticket item, we'd even go as low as six units per month. But the goal is to purchase enough inventory where you have enough SKUs out with available stock that you're able to capitalize on the buy box. Because what having more, what more ASINs available in your catalog does is allows you to win the more buy box more frequently and increase your buy box share across the board for all your ASINs. So although you may have some products that you're not winning the buy box on, you have the other products that can make up that inventory.
Uh, we do not do any manufacturing barcodes. We do all seller barcodes, and we highly advise against using manufacturer barcodes or commingled inventory because Amazon's a nightmare. Because what they do is they take all the sellers who got commingled inventory, they put them in a bin, and when someone orders it, they ship it. And I don't trust the way other sellers operate their business. A lot of people do a lot of shady shit. They don't care about quality control. And that's not me. I only want the product that I labeled going to one of my customers at the end of the day. It's plain and simple. So we do not do any commingled manufacturer barcode inventory. It's just a rule of thumb for us. And if you have a listing that all is only allowing manufacturer barcode, simply if you don't have any stock and you never sent it in, simply delete that merchant SKU and recreate it. And in the recreation process, there'll be a drop down that says um, manufacturer barcode or seller. It's like seller SKU or seller barcode. Is Amazon closing FBA accounts or just drop shipping accounts? So Amazon has closed a ton of drop shipping accounts in the past six to nine months, uh, literally thousands of them. Um, but the beautiful thing about a pure FBA account that you've never drop shipped on is it's kind of complicated to get your account suspended. And as long as you're operating within terms of service and not navigating around it, doing any shady black hat shit, um, your account's pretty protected. And there's never been a there's never been a company that's connected with us for an appeal um, for an account suspension that's operated within terms that we haven't been able to get back. It just that's how it works. When you do ship by the book, Amazon recognizes it and rewards you. So it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Don't do anything shady and your account will be protected. Now, there's always those one off scenarios where, um, you know, people possibly haven't done anything shady. But in one day they get a bunch of IP complaints and that's it for them. And there's really no way to predict that other than analyzing the data on the Amazon listings. And it's interesting because everybody who has their account suspended in the immediate first conversation that we have with them, they always tell us that they didn't do anything wrong. They don't know what they did. They, they operate by the book. And then once we get on the phone call with them, it starts to unravel. Right. It's yeah. Well, I bought this from like an eBay seller. And it's like, what? Like, why didn't you say that from the beginning? We're like a, the, the, the person who's getting your account reinstated. That's like lying to your lawyer. It just doesn't make logical sense. Beginners, I, I suggest getting into really any category approved to sell it. So just start scanning things into your seller's app or on Seller Central and following the prompts all the way up, uh, through. You know, click request approval. You may get some auto approvals and auto on gates. You may have to submit invoicing for others. But the goal is to just keep requesting approval until you get some products that you send to Amazon. Right. So regardless of the category, it could be patio, it could be toys, it could be grocery, it could be health and household, could be industrial and scientific, could be baby, could be pet supply. Just try, try to get approval for as many, especially initially, as many as you can possibly. And on Instagram, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, I posted maybe a video with like seven to 10 different companies where their invoices will work for ungating and they have very low MOQs. Um, what do you think of product list analyzing tools and apps? Um, I like them. You know, we use them in our business. I think the best one, which unfortunately isn't on the market yet, it's only available for Inner Circle, is SourceCorrect. That's our own proprietary software that my business partner Sebastian developed. It's definitely the most powerful uh, UPC scraper and sourcing tool on or really off the market, but somewhat on the market because about 40 people are using it right now. Um, so it's a game changer. But second to that would be like scan unlimited, tactical arbitrage. But here's the thing. There's a common misconception. Is that a UPC scraper like scan unlimited, tactical arbitrage, even source correct? It's going to do all the work for you. It's a common misconception. It's not. It's not because all it's doing is scraping UPCs versus Amazon's back end catalog. What it's not doing is title searches. Right. What it's not doing is searching for pack sizes that aren't connected to the OG UPC that you're missing out on. So if you're just using UPC scrapers to leverage business growth, you're doing it completely wrong. Um, you get you get source correct at all four levels of inner circle. You just get different plans. So for like brain trust, you get three months of source correct. M club, you get six months of source correct. High society, you get a year of source correct. So it depends. 
right? And the, and the way, even when we do drop source correct to the public, maybe, I don't know, eight to 12 months from now, um, Inner Circle will always have first access to any new features. That's just how it is, right? We reward the businesses that invest in themselves and invest in our, our guidance. So they'll always be ahead of the curve. Inner Circle businesses will always be growing faster than everybody else because they have a direct source to me and Sebastian, who our business continues to grow. How did you do your first year on Amazon? We did about a million dollars our first year on Amazon. Solely Costco, BJ, Scams Club. Second year was probably five. Third year was probably 12 to 15. Fourth year, we were pumping out 25 million. Year five was like 30. Year six was in COVID happened. We went from 30 to 50. And ever since then, we've been growing about 20% year over year. So it was like 50, la 50 year six, maybe 60 year seven. And we're probably going to crush about 70 to 75 this year. It's all about growth for me. We have a Canada company. Is it possible to get goods from U.S. brands with Canadian company? Yes, it's possible. Absolutely. So I have a three that 300 square foot shop made 46 K in revenue within four months. That's huge one and only. It's massive. So you're looking at about 15 K a month. Still a lot of room for growth though. A lot of room for growth, even in that little 300 square foot space, as long as you're optimizing it, you know, the goal would be to operate out of the air until you hit your apex, right? It's something we talk a lot about in inner circles, the apex of your company. It's essentially the top. If you draw a parabola, which is like a kind of a half circle upside down, at the top of it's the apex. So the apex is when you start seeing diminishing returns, right? So every employee you hire you're actually making less money because the diminishing returns come from your lack of available space to move efficiently within your workspace. So like once you hit that apex, you're screwed. The, the more you do, the less you make. So the goal is to invest in a new space before you hit that apex. Uh, one and only, yeah, in a, in a nutshell, Amazon collects the tax on your behalf. Um, I know you shouldn't be remitting tax for those transactions. Amazon remits it for you, but I always encourage you to consult with a CPA from your state because I'm not a tax professional. Yeah, I agree. MM just said the amount of value in these live calls is insane. The private Monday calls are even better. Imagine what the inner circle calls are like. <laughs> Fucking next level. So that's a great question. So Mr. That Feel Good says, is in-store sourcing the best be for beginning to scale with minimal capital? Absolutely. In-store sourcing through ERA and online sourcing through OA would be the best to start because realistically, you can start with a couple hundred bucks. And the education you're going to receive through that couple hundred dollar investment, it's going to be priceless. It's really going to set the foundation for your firm. So I'm going to finish up this call. I'm going to slide, slide downstairs to the gym. Um, work on my physical health, then I'm going to come up here, take a shower, stop at a CVS, pick up a car, throw the cash in it and go, uh, I'm picking up desserts. My brother's picking up dinner. You know, my dad, he's been a chef for, he's no longer a chef, but for when I was a kid until I was like maybe 12 or 13, he worked in a Spanish restaurant. Um, not Latin Spanish, like Spain Spanish. And uh, he's a phenomenal chef, phenomenal. So typically when we get together, he always whips up these extravagant meals. And I was talking to him on the phone last night. And I was like, dad, you don't cook anything, man. He's like, no, I'm not cooking nothing. No, no plans for conferences in the UK. But what I can tell you is as soon as we get a, a, a seller from the UK in the inner circle, we'll be on the UK hosting an event there. I just need a reason to go over there. So if you're if you're a seller doing seven figures plus annually and you live in the UK and you're ready to join Inner Circle, send me a DM. We'll get you set up and then we'll come out to your warehouse or your space, help you optimize it, train your team, whatever the case may be. And then we'll plan an event right around that. So we got well, right now Inner Circle has two countries uh, or three countries, Colombia, um, U.S. and Canada. Yeah, yeah. Inner Circle accommodates sellers from all over the world. Like I just said, we got a, a couple companies in Colombia, Canada, and the U.S. So we work with anybody who's willing to grow. That's the name of the game. All right, my friends. Listen, I got to go hit the gym, hop in the shower, go see my pops. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Have a beautiful weekend. Also, tomorrow on the live coaching call for eSellers Rye, collectively we're going to be deciding what hotel we're all going to be staying at, at asd so make sure you pop onto that live call tomorrow 
um, because there's a few vents coming up right around the pipeline. ASD is about uh, 60 days out. So I'll check everybody on tomorrow's live call for all you ERI members, everybody else. We'll check you on the flip side, hopefully next Sunday. Have a beautiful day. Stay grateful and stay with my friends. Adios.